But the time has come to return to the genre of which Martin is rightfully considered the king. You know, the FBI, the gangsters, it all goes together. It's mind-boggling. Work on a remake of the crime thriller Internal Affairs began, while The Aviator was still in the final stages of being edited. In 2003, Production company Plan B Entertainment bought the rights to remake the Asian box office hit from Hong Kong for one and a half million dollars. Company owner Brad Pitt had originally planned to star in the film with Tom Cruise, but Tom declined because of delays, and William Monaghan's script got Scorsese's attention. The Departed reminded him of his favorite film with a similar plot, the film noir drama White Heat. Cellmate, stick with him until you find out where he unloaded $300,000 in federal currency without a single bill showing up. He was also intrigued by the challenge of making a film set in the present day, a rare experience in his career. It was only after he had agreed to participate that Martin found out it was a remake. This was upsetting for him. He decided not to watch the original film until after he had filmed his own, primarily to minimize stylistic similarities. The director invited DiCaprio to join the project right away, but that time Brad Pitt had already agreed to star in Babel, but he stayed on the project as a producer. Pitt also believed that Leonardo was bringing some much needed youth to a story for which he considered himself a bit too old. Are you serious? Warner Brothers allocated $40 million to the production and demanded that filming began immediately. Casting suddenly became a race against time. The setting was moved to Boston, and so selecting a talented actor who had grown up on the streets presented an obvious choice. Really? Matt Damon was given a chance to audition, where he proved that he would fill an irreplaceable role in the film. Yeah, really. But then the director faced nothing but challenges. The role of Dignum was rejected by Ray Liotta, so Scorsese turned to his second choice, Mark Wahlberg. But the actor declined the offer for about a month, possibly in an effort to avoid working with DiCaprio after the basketball diaries. Yeah, we're friends, right, Mark? Friends till the end. Do you accept me as your friend? Sure. I'm gonna fucking kill you, huh? I'm gonna fucking kill you! That was a joke! But in the end, the director's experience and charisma prevailed. Mark based his character on the police who had arrested him in his youth more than 20 times as well as his parents' subsequent reactions. I know what you are, okay? I know what you are and I know what you're not. I'm the best friend you have on the face of this earth and I'm gonna help you understand something, you punk. You know fucking cough. Frank Costello is the anti-hero and central character of the film. Martin had initially invited De Niro to play the role, but Robert was in the middle of shooting his own film, The Good Shepherd. Al Pacino also declined. Yet again. Option three seemed like a total long shot. Jack Nicholson, who very rarely appeared in films, rejected the offer outright. But Scorsese didn't give up. With DiCaprio and screenwriter William Monaghan in tow, he went to meet with the actor personally in hopes of persuading him. They must have left the right impression because Nicholson agreed, albeit on his own terms. Filming comedies was exhausting, and Jack longed to embody pure evil on screen. Monaghan was tasked with rewriting and expanding the role. The screenwriter found inspiration in the real leader of the Boston mob, Whitey Bulger. As the number two most wanted on the FBI's list, second only to Osama bin Laden, speaks for itself. Former undercover detective Tom Duffy, who spent more than 30 years with the Boston police, assisted in recreating the crime boss's image and providing advice regarding authenticity on the set. The final touch that convinced Jack to star in the film, though, was total freedom to improvise. I can't wait to wipe that fucking smirk right off of your face. Would you rather wipe my ass for me? Scorsese agreed to support the actor no matter how crazy the stunt, because it would only highlight the character's unpredictability. I'm an artist. You give me a fucking tuber, I'll get you something out of it. Three of the best examples of Nicholson's insanity, throwing cocaine at prostitutes. Want some coke? the strap-on in the porn theater. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? And using a real pistol in the scene with DiCaprio, which Leonardo later said was one of the most memorable moments of his life. You've got something you wanna 
ask me? Auditions had all but dried up, but it wasn't over. Mel Gibson turned down the role of Ellerby. If Alec Baldwin, who had impressed the director of the set of The Aviator, had not come to the rescue, Martin would not have met his deadline. I know that. The last addition to the cast were Vera Farmiga and Martin Sheen, who agreed without even reading the script because he had been dreaming of working with Scorsese for 30 years. Do you know what we do here? Despite the challenges along the way, a solid cast had finally been assembled, but top-notch actors required decent pay, and this had an effect on the project's budget, which had now grown to $90 million. Half of that went towards the actors' fees. I'm sorry. Uh... It was necessary. <laughs> the Departed was the last collaboration between Scorsese and Michael Ballhaus. The film was the cinematographer's swan song, bringing an end to his career in Hollywood. By the way, the director always cared about Michael's opinion, considering that Ballhaus had filmed both Damon and Nicholson over the previous decade. Perhaps it was his recommendation that Martin had invited these actors to join the film. Why would you have to remind me of that? Would I, would I be any good? And what I do. Filming lasted from April to August of 2005. The incredible steep taxes on filmmaking in Massachusetts meant that the team had just a couple of weeks to get the material they needed in Boston. The most crucial scenes were filmed in the subway. It took DiCaprio and Sheen 50 trips and two days of shooting for a one minute sequence in the final cut. Hey, where are you? Look down the car. Yeah. A hallmark of the film is its memorable places and details, the X's that mark characters for death. The Rolling Stones song, Gimme Shelter, which had previously featured in Goodfellas and Casino. And some even subtler hints. Costello and Sullivan struck up their friendship in a convenience store, and Billy's fight in that same store led to him meeting Frank. The contents of the groceries in the first and final scenes are almost identical. This may be the most intricate detail of the movie. It was Frank who had filled the bag, and working for him is what led to his particular incident. And here's a noteworthy line for you. You got any suits at home, or you like coming to work dressed like you're going to invade Poland? Because the Nazis designed their uniforms based on the design and patterns of the Massachusetts State Police. As was the case in Gangs of New York, the animals were computer generated. And although making a fake rat look real was a much easier task, its appearance was much more significant to the plot. Filming wore Martin out. At each stage of production, the impending finale of the film was morally exhausting. Try as one might, a director can't help but feel close to their characters and experience sincere feelings towards them. What do you get, your period? Scorsese did admit that the film was good, especially since he considered The Departed to be his first film with a real plot. But it drained him of his vitality. He was a psychiatrist. I mean, I like the picture, but the process of making it, particularly in post-production, was highly unpleasant. I said, I don't care how much I'm being paid, it'll kill me. I'll die. Very simply. Jesus Christ. The film premiered September 26, 2006. Opening weekend showed that the production team's sacrifices had not been in vain. Audiences appreciated the film and it grossed $300 million at the box office. Four months later, Martin won the Golden Globe for Best Director, and the Academy presented the film with nominations in five categories. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio was not nominated for Best Actor only because Warner Brothers didn't want to distinguish him from the other cast members. Instead, the studio promoted Leo's candidacy for Blood Diamond. Leonardo DiCaprio is here. Hi, Leo. How you doing? I don't have a joke. I just thought the ladies wanted to look at him for a second, so... And to increase his colleagues' chances of winning for The Departed, Leonardo turned down the nomination for Best Male Actor in a supporting role. As a result, Mark Wahlberg was selected from the group of actors, but ultimately lost to Alan Arkin. 
This was the only nomination that The Departed didn't win at the Oscars. Thelma Schoonmacher emerged victorious for a third time, and William Monaghan took home the trophy for Best Adapted Screenplay. And of course, the main awards of the evening. For the first time in his career, at 64 years of age, Martin Scorsese's film won the Academy Award for Best Picture. And the Oscar goes to The Departed. And he himself won Best Director after six attempts. And the Oscar goes to Martin Scorsese. Thank you. Could, could you double check the envelope? <laughs> this was the first remake in history to receive the top prize. It was the triumph that Scorsese had been longing for for 25 years. Ironically, winning awards for The Departed never even occurred to Scorsese, because he thought that such a dirty, crude, and violent movie would scare the Academy away. It's a good reminder that you only get what you want when you stop asking for it. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe fuck yourself. It seemed like things would finally settle down, but that same year, Martin released two more films. The first was an amazing short mockumentary called The Key to Reserva. There's a page missing, we don't know what happened in between. Yes, these are uh, pages from, uh, and here's the, here's, the, here's the best part, these are pages from a Hitchcock film. The plot describes how Martin finds an unproduced screenplay by Alfred Hitchcock, which he then decides to film. It's sort of an ode to Hitchcock's work and that of composer Bernard Herrmann. The second project was a documentary-style portrayal of a Rolling Stones concert, whose music had accompanied his career over the past 25 years. Okay, first song. Mick Jagger and the rest of the band put on an outstanding show at the Beacon Theatre which Scorsese and Robert Richardson then turned into a captivating film. Shine a Light was released in 2008 and earned $15 million at the box office. Hey, do you like our work? Let us know with your like and comment. Push that subscribe button and share with your friends. If you want to support the project financially, become our sponsor on Patreon or YouTube sponsorship. Thank you.